Hi, this is Sam Weigel with V1 Rotate, and this week we're flying to Boeing Field to visit the Seattle Museum of Flight and discuss a serious topic, the level of physical risk involved in establishing a flying career. Last week I was flying a transcontinental flight in the Boeing 737 and my first officer and I got into a discussion about the pilot shortage, who's getting into professional flying today, and what some of the barriers to entry are. The usual suspects came up, time, money, age, health, cultural factors, but then my FO said something that stopped me short. The general public, he said, sees this as a risky job, and the funny thing is, they're actually not wrong. It is one of the deadliest. Whoa, what? That doesn't sound right. Yep, I looked it up. Every year, the U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration publishes a list of top 10 deadliest jobs. In 2021, aircraft pilot was number five with 34.5 deaths per 100,000 working pilots, 10 times deadlier than the overall workplace fatality rate. We're still well behind infamously dangerous jobs like fishing and logging, and even a bit behind roofers, but have a slightly higher fatality rate than iron workers. To be honest, this is something that most people in my position don't think about very often because the risk in professional flying is not at all evenly distributed. Airline flying has become astonishingly safe and accordingly boring. These days, I have to get my risk quotient through recreational flying, motorcycling, dirt biking, offshore sailing, and skydiving. It wasn't always this way. The airlines of the 1930s through 1960s crashed with frightening regularity. The Lockheed Constellation, for example, suffered 98 fatal accidents out of only 856 airframes built. If that rate had carried over to the Boeing 737, the most produced airliner of all time, nearly 1,300 of them would have had fatal accidents. The actual number is 78, and more than half of these were the original 100 and 200 series, which made up only 10% of the production run. In the early 1960s, the worldwide jet fatal accident rate was over 10 per million departures. That number is now 0.04, 250 times safer. A big part of that is due to advances in flight deck technology. This graph from an Airbus statistical analysis shows the evolution of the accident rate by aircraft generation. The second reason for the reduced accident rate is the increased use of safety management systems at the airlines and the overwhelming acceptance and adoption of crew resource management among airline pilots. Accordingly, airline piloting has become an incredibly safe job, especially in the U.S. and Europe. Since the year 2000, only 32 pilots have died in U.S. Part 121 accidents, plus the eight lost to terrorism on 9-11. An inordinate number, 17, flew for cargo airlines and 11 for regional airlines. The last U.S. major passenger airline pilots to die in crashes were the crews of Alaska 261 and American 587, both more than 20 years ago. But not everyone wants to be an airline pilot, and jet pilots aren't born in the flight levels. They're made down here in the weeds with the mere mortals, where the risk picture looks very different. The Part 121 accident rate from 2001 to 2017 was 0.006 per 100,000 flight hours. The general aviation rate over that same period averaged 1.22 fatal accidents per 100,000 flight hours, more than 200 times worse. Now, even here, the risk picture varies considerably. In 2019, there were 189 fatal fixed-wing general aviation accidents. Only five of them involved turbine aircraft. 11 occurred during business flights, and one was executive slash corporate. Corporate and fractional flying is pretty safe these days. Six fatal accidents occurred during Part 135 operations, which, frankly, isn't a bad year in what used to be a pretty dangerous area of aviation. The on-demand Part 135 fatal accident rate is down to about 0.25 per 100,000 hours, which is nowhere near the airlines, but is at least five times safer than general aviation overall. In what the FAA calls non-commercial fixed-wing operations, not under Part 135 or 121, it is personal flying that accounts for nearly 80% of the accident. This includes your non-instructional time building and is an area you really have to be careful about. Well, what about flight instruction? Surprisingly, it's about twice as as personal flying, 
with a fatal accident rate of 0.6 per 100,000 hours as calculated by AOPA. Still, this is likely to be the most dangerous flying you do in your professional career. Hour for hour, you are 100 times more likely to die while flight instructing than while flying for the airlines. Statistically, if you instruct for 1,000 hours, you have a 0.6% chance, or 1 in 166, of having a fatal accident while doing so. Assuming you instruct 800 hours per year, that's nearly four times the fatality rate of commercial fishermen, more than five times the fatality rate of loggers. Beyond the stats, I want to get personal for a moment. I've lost two people close to me in aircraft accidents, and they were both in the early stages of their career. The first happened when I was only 16, and it made a strong impression on me. My first flight instructor, Slade Shipshock, died at the age of 25 on a cold, snowy night in Watertown, South Dakota. He had just made a quick cargo stop and didn't get out of the airplane, and so didn't notice the ice buildup that caused a tailplane stall on his subsequent takeoff. The second accident happened when I was 22 and flying single pilot part 135 freight for Ameriflight. Mike Ahn and I had flown together at several previous jobs and he was covering my route up California's Owens Valley while Ameriflight trained me on the twin engine Navajo. Mike was killed when he clipped the top of a cinder cone in the middle of the valley in straight level flight at cruise airspeed. It was a beautiful day in the valley and as near as anybody can tell, Mike simply fell asleep after being fatigued from flying the route for a week in poor weather. I don't want to scare anyone away from a career in aviation, but you do need to realize that the danger is real, especially in the early stages of your career, when you're flying less capable aircraft, when you're less experienced, and often when you're young and haven't really developed much risk aversion yet. Some of this comes down to the career path you choose. The quicker you get to part 121, or simply to fly in turbine equipment, the safer. Flight instructing is inherently risky, but less so in a structured environment with supportive management. Part 135 flying is safer than flight instructing, but mostly if you're flying good equipment, you have a capable autopilot or two pilots, and you're at a company where they don't push their pilots to fly in unsafe conditions. Once you start flying full time, you'll build flight time faster than you ever have before and it's really easy to get complacent. Don't let this happen to you. Keep your guard up. Assume that every student is trying to kill you. Assume that the weather is trying to kill you. Assume that your airplane will break, your instruments will fail, your engine will sputter at the worst possible time. Don't let your boss talk you into doing anything dumb. Don't let ambition or excitement for the next stage of your career rob you of focus on staying alive in your current position. Looking back at my own early career, I shake my head at what a dumb kid I was. I did a lot of high risk flying in old marginally equipped aircraft of variable maintenance in mountainous terrain and poor weather. I was a great instrument pilot back then, probably better than I am today, but my judgment wasn't really there yet and I scared myself badly a few times. Still, I was smart enough to say no to my boss on several sticky occasions and that plus a good bit of luck is why I'm here today to tell the tale. I hope you'll take this advice to heart. Once you gain experience and are flying capable equipment, this is a very safe career, but in the meantime, please, please, please be careful, be conservative, study the misfortune of others, know what can happen to you, and take the steps to prevent it. I want you to stay alive and well until you make it to the right seat of my 737, and we can tell each other stories about the battle days while we wing across the country at flight level 350.